good morning. Picking up where we left off last week. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And then we came down to verse 6, which says, Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. Now let's stop right there for a minute. See, even devils have that faith. James tells us plainly the devils believe in one God. They know there's one God. So the first part of that is if you believe there is a God. See what, what's amazing there? The Proverbs says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So that you know that there's a lot of people that don't have the faith of demons? Demons know there's one God. Anyway. But see, that's not enough, is it? He that comes to God. Boy, man, hang on. Whew. I felt a wave right there. <laughs> he felt it too. Okay, glory to God. Frosteri kiato. Masto kidai. I am a rewarder. I am a rewarder of those that diligently seek me. Fear not. Fear not those things that are coming upon the earth. For have I not spoken unto you? And I said, you let not your heart be troubled. You let it not. Neither let it be afraid. For I am with you. I will not forsake you. I have not left you orphans. I am with you, says the Lord. And I am a rewarder. Be not moved by those things that come upon the earth. Be not moved by the external. Be moved by me on the internal. For I am in you and I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will take you by the hand and walk you through every trial. I am the fourth man with you no matter what happens. Be not afraid, says your Lord. Whew. Glory to God. That's just take over, Lord. We're fine with this. Hallelujah. See, and last week when we was teaching on this, we went to some of the a few of the heroes of faith in chapter eleven. We talked about Noah. For a hundred years, it sure didn't look like he was like God was a rewarder. I'm not going to re-preach that, but not one drop of rain fell, as far as I can tell, during the hundred years that he was building the ark and it never rained the earth was watered by a mist you talk about no evidence nobody believed his preaching we're told that he was a preacher of righteousness meaning he told them what God said judgment is coming you better repent he's a preacher of righteousness for a hundred years not a single convert not even a relative not a cousin not an uncle not a friend nobody got on the boat with him Talked about Daniel in the lion's den, which in the middle of it, when they, boy, I bet you pitch black dark, they put him down in that cave with the lions, and it says they put a big stone, a big, big rock over the entrance, so it's, you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's pitch black dark. All you can hear is the heavy breathing of lions, you know. Right at that moment, sure didn't look like, can you imagine, I can just hear that devil. Where's your God now? He's a rewarder, is he? How you like him, that rewarder? See, and we went on, but, did, but it would, did God reward him? Absolutely, and his testimony affected a nation. See, we overcome the lamb by the blood. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb. We don't overcoat the lamb. <laughs> but we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. See, what, what's coming not all of us are called to be evangelists. I thank God for every evangelist. But see, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Each of us has a testimony. You're going to be sharing your testimony like never before. God's going to use that to evangelize. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. We've all got a testimony. 
So you may not be an evangelist, but you're a testimonian. <laughs> hey, Dave made up words all the time. Isn't that right? Somebody was even working on a Dave dictionary with new words just by day. Hallelujah. You're a testimonian. You can, sure tes you can share your testimony, can't you? You can tell what great things Jesus has done for you. But just one other part of that verse. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Now see, that exactly is what the Lord's been purging out of us during this time of the fire. The love of our own life. I had to keep reminding myself yesterday it was Saturday and they're playing football. Now to many of you, you're going, what's that got to do? You just don't know what a deliverance that is. And then I have to go, oh, I better check the scores. I actually turned on a game two different times. They were teams that I should be interacting. It was so boring I couldn't watch it. He's changing. Yes, sir. Go to Luke 11. Go to Luke 11. You can read it. I don't know if he's going to let me read or not today. Yes, sir. See, we're only living for revival. That's our part to play in this. This is, this is the part of the promised land. I shared with you a week or two ago about reading a book by a preacher who's very successful by any standards. And if I even read the whole book. I didn't see a single thing in there like wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, and that's part of my job. <laughs> You know, I can't help it. I'm always on alert for false doctrine because I want to protect the sheep, you know. And I, I want to protect, I don't want to get into anything myself, but very successful. I mean, if you look at his church and our church, they look like polar opposites. They're very successful. Get a lot of people, and I thank God for them. They get a lot of people saved and healed, and, and they're very prosperous. Well, thank God for them, you know. And in fact, so far through the book, I was going, God, why are you having me read this? This is not helping me. It makes me look, I feel more like a failure now than I did before I started reading the book, you know. And then I finally got to it, and he's got several children, but he's, he's only got one son. And his son, son and born is sworn. <laughs> his son was born. <laughs> his son was born with a birth defect. And he loves his son. And he knows it's not God's best. And of course, like any good parent, they're doing everything they can in the natural. Everything that can be done in the natural, which I would do too for, for him. But he knows. He knows. And he even asks for prayer. All you readers of this book, please pray. Because he knows that's not God's best. And I knew right then, I said, there it is. See, that's the part of the promised land. That supernatural working of the Holy Ghost, that supernatural working of the Father, that supernatural working of Christ that can go in and correct a birth defect. Do the really impossible. See, that is our niche. That is the part of the promised land that we have been commanded to conquer. We are to possess that land, and nobody has really possessed it since the book of Acts. Not really. Now, we've had a lot of great things happen. I thank God for the healing revivals of the 50s after World War II, that 40s and 50s. I thank God for everything that's been done. But the vast majority of that has been by the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God we're to covet the best gifts. But just like Alan says, we're not supposed to stay there. That's, that's why you're a baby. That's why it's in the 1 Corinthians. That's the most baby church in the whole New Testament, yet they were operating in the gifts. Well, thank God he doesn't abandon us while we're still carnal but that's not what God, that's not how we're I will be able to speak I'll just say it again the way I heard it there's a part of the promised land which is the part of the gospel that has not been possessed in this generation really in any generation since the book of Acts and that's where they all get healed first time, every time, no exceptions. 
And we saw that over 25 years ago, and we've been calling that, calling that, and now he's incorporating godly hope with that. But that is our mission. And when I read the book, I, when I got to that part, I went, that's the part. That's our part. Sure, I wish we had the building fixed. Sure, I wish we had nicer things. Sure, I wish we had better carpet. Sure, I wish all those things. But I could give a rip about that compared to getting that boy healed from that birth defect. Now, that's the calling that we have on us. That's our assignment. Nothing else is. So we got to be like the horse that they put the blinders on. I'm not look to the left, not look to the right. We just go straight ahead into battle until we conquer this land. The reason he had me go to Luke 11, he's been teaching me more of all things out of the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but we hardly have, I, I've never really seen it really from the Lord's perspective until recently. I was going to teach today about on the other half of faith because last week I felt like we mostly looked at people and looked at the hard part in the middle where the only thing you have is your faith and that's a big part of faith. But see, you could go right through the Gospels and at Jesus time and again, he says, your faith has made you whole. Remember that? The woman with the issue of blood? Daughter, thy faith hath saved thee. Remember that blind, uh, the blind man? Be it unto you according to your faith. Not the Lord's faith, your faith. Now there's other times where it's strictly the Lord's faith. I noticed God did not send the madman of Gadara to a 12-step program. He's beyond self-help. He's beyond doing anything. Sometimes, thank God for Jesus and his faith. He just came in and did it. Same with the woman that was bowed over for 18 years, wasn't it? As far as I can tell, it wasn't her faith at all. But see, she had a spirit of infirmity too, see. He didn't send her to no 12. No. Didn't send her to send. I do know how to speak. I just don't a lot. He didn't send her to any 12-step program either. Now, I'm not against 12-step programs. Stay on track. Yes, sir. The Lord's Prayer. That's where we're going to focus today. Now, before we really get into the Lord's Prayer, see, Matthew 6, when he teaches the Lord's Prayer, he expands the teaching when it comes to give us this day our daily bread. Matthew 6, he focuses on our daily bread and really about our needs and especially our financial needs because that's where he talks about you can't serve God and mammon. And he's trying to get you to understand you have a father who will provide for you. He says, consider the birds. They're his pets. They don't sow. They don't reap. He takes care of them. Consider the lilies of the field. They're his garden. He takes care of them. You are his child. Are you not much more valuable to him than they? Yes. He says, don't be worrying about what you're going to eat. What you're going to. Don't spend your whole life like unbelievers who live that way their whole life. Their whole, every day, every day is concerned about meeting our needs. No. He plain, he, you talk about red letters from the lips of him who cannot lie. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you, see. So in Matthew 6, when he talks about our bread, he really focuses on our needs. But Luke 11, when he teaches the Lord's Prayer, he focuses on delivering bread to other people. And that's where we are. See, there is bread available for that pastor's son in the book I'm talking about. Jesus has already paid the price. Healing has already been placed on the table. God is not withholding the miracle for that boy or any, any of these others up here that we've been praying for. Any, quote, impossible situations, which there is no such thing as that with God. So in Luke 11's account, he teaches about going in and getting the bread. And it took me forever. I mean, I don't know how long, and I can't reteach that. He's really teaching about going into God's presence. And that's why it's ask, seek, and knock. So you don't knock on a door unless you plan on going in, do you? And I don't know how I missed that for so many decades, but I did. I just didn't get it. 
Because what he had been doing was he had been spending his time in prayer. He had knocked and entered, and he was alone with the Father, and he was spending time in prayer, it says. And then when he finished, and he's obviously doing it privately because they couldn't hear what he was saying. So maybe he was far enough away or something by himself. But if they'd have known what he was saying, they wouldn't have said, teach us to pray. But they saw the pattern. He'd go like that and get alone with the Father and pray, and boy, he'd come out and shazam. Miracles would happen, you know. Healings would happen. So he's going, well, would you teach us? Teach us how to pray. Why? We want to have the same results. So here we go. It starts in Luke 11. He starts, same thing as Matthew 6, our Father, which art in heaven. So where is our Father? You see, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three separate and all three one. And right there, your brain starts leaking out your left ear. Because our finite mind has a really hard time with that. But God the Father himself, as far as I can tell, never leaves heaven. He's always in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven. So that's where the Father is. And he says, hallowed be thy name. Well, hallowed, if you look it up, it means reverence, respect. There is no other God but you. You're the only God. I, I love the verse in the prophets in the Old Testament where God lets us know. He says, I'll, I'll, do you, I'll do you a good one here. I've already looked around heaven. I've already looked around everywhere. I know you can't look, so I looked for you, God says. <laughs> he says, there is no other God but me. Well, hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. So that's all we're saying. There's, I'm not going to serve any other gods. I'm not going to bow down. We talked about the Hebrew children last week. They would say, our God's able to deliver us from your furnace, but whether he does or not, we will not bow to any God but him. Well, that's hallowed be thy name. See? Then he says, though, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth just as it is in heaven. And normally there, we'll start going, and that I have and most teachers will take you to the woman with the issue of blood. I'll take you to the, the woman bowed over for 18 years. That wasn't the will of God. See Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the man, with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all, all, all that were oppressed of the devil. So that's good to preach. But we usually, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. My thinking normally reverts to that side of the equation, us needing the kingdom to be manifested in our lives and our faith makes a draw on the kingdom and we get the results. And there's nothing wrong with that. But only recently has we been flipping the equation. Because when Jesus prays that, when Jesus prays that, see, this is the Lord's Prayer. This is, they said, teach us to pray the way you pray. So you think he's doing that? So what is Jesus thinking? What is he thinking when he says, Father, my Father, which art in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. What's he thinking? See, because that kingdom has to come through him. He's moving our mindset there. He was the vessel through whom the Father himself could work. He was not doing, he himself was not doing the will of the Father. He plainly tells you, it's not me, it's the Father in me. Now see, in another place, he says now, People that tell you the kingdom's over there or the kingdom's over there, he says, don't believe them. Because the kingdom of God is within you. Well, was it within him? Now, see, he was the vessel so surrendered. And that surrender was really complete at the baptism of John. When John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. See, when you lay, what, what is Baptism. When you lay somebody down in that water, that's a type of the grave. I'm dead to my old... When we think of it, I repent. I'm dead to that old life of sin. That old Gary... <laughs> bury that rascal. <laughs> Go ahead. 
go under the water. But see, when Jesus was raised out of the water, that was his visual. He, in other words, he was saying, I know why you sent me. I know. When John lays me down in this water, I know that I'm going all the way to the cross. This is my visual vow to you. I'm going all the way to the cross. But when John raises me up out of the water, that demonstrates my faith in your promise. You will not leave my soul in hell. See, people that tell you that Jesus didn't go to hell to suffer for you, they just don't read the Bible. I'm sorry. I don't care if they got a Dr. DDS and Dr. Dentist and whatever else they are. I don't care. You will not leave my soul where? I remember when it dawned on me. This is the man. This, see, Jesus didn't do anything as God, really. He did everything as a man. That's why we can look unto him as the author and finisher of our faith. But if that man, the man, Jesus of Nazareth, you talk about faith. You talk about faith that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, what if God doesn't come through? What if God doesn't come through on that promise? Here's Jesus committing himself to not only die physically, but to go to hell in your place. And what if God does not come through? Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will my flesh see corruption. I see to the Jewish mind, that means he had to be raised before the fourth day. You remember Lazarus? Four days. By now he stinketh in the mind of the Jew. Corruption sets in on the fourth day. Neither will my flesh see corruption. So he's saying, I'm not only trusting you to raise my soul out of there, you're going to raise my body. And if God doesn't come through, he has no way out of hell. You talk about faith. But he said, my, here's my vow when John raises me up. I'm trusting you, Father. You will keep your word. You talk about faith. You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will my flesh see corruption. You're going to raise me up before the fourth day. About to have a running fit, Christine. <laughs> Can't hardly stand it myself. But because of his total surrender, and I'm going to bring a verse with, with that that you may not have seen, but uh, it's just real simple. It's Romans 12 1. At that moment, he presented his body a living sacrifice. Now, he'd already been doing that, living holy every day, because he never sinned, not even once. It's hard for me to picture a little boy growing up, never lying to mama once, never stealing a cookie once. <laughs> but he did. But boy, that day, he was presenting his body. He knew what was coming. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Boy, if anybody ever presented his body, if you want to, it might be good every once in a while to watch Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ again. It's available, last time I watched it, it was available for free on YouTube if you want to watch it. The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. And they did a pretty good job. I mean, it was way worse than that because it says he was, Isaiah tells us it was so bad you couldn't even tell if it was a human anymore. He didn't even look like a man anymore. But that is bad, it's bad enough, boy. And, and I'm watching that. And I, I can't help it. I'm a visual person. I flinch, man, every time. They, and I, there's one scene where the, a hook gets a hold in, in his flesh and just rips off a chunk of flesh. And the cry is, why? This man is innocent. This man didn't do anything. He never one time. You talk about presenting your body. Nobody ever presented their body like Jesus. A living sacrifice. Boy, there it is. But we're told to do the same thing. Present your body a living sacrifice. He's not asking us to be scourged by the Romans. But he's telling us, say no to that thing. Say no to it. See, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us something. What does it teach us? Denying 
ungodliness, denying fleshly lusts. We are to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. The power to say no is what he did. He, he quickened us with the very life of Christ. We, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, see. Well, he is in, he is in us, and that's why the kingdom is in us. So getting back to, to Jesus at John's baptism, so here comes the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of the Father. There's never, Jesus did not do a single miracle before the day that the Holy Spirit came on him. That's the reason the Apocrypha is not in our Bible, and it shouldn't be in our Bible, because it tells stories before that day, like one of them I remember was Jesus bringing a little bird back to life, and there's other things, no. No, he didn't do any miracles. It plainly tells you that the changing of the water to wine is the beginning of miracles. And that's after he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, what's going on? What's the difference? He lived holy before the baptism. He never sinned even before. Well, that's the power of the new nature. That's the power of the inward man that Alan teaches us all about all the time that I'm trying to understand. <laughs> but that is the power of the new man. That's the power of Christ in you to live holy but see, he didn't do any miracles until uh, the Spirit of the Father came to dwell on the inside of his human body. And from that moment on, he is the temple of God. From that moment on, his Father was still in heaven. But the works I do, it's not really me. It's the Father in me. Well, where is he? Is he in heaven or in you? Both. God the Father never leaves heaven himself. But his spirit does. And it's the Holy Ghost on the inside of Christ that did all of those miracles. We could say the spirit of the Father. He said, it's the Father in me. Well, it's the Holy Ghost in him. It's the spirit of the Father. So when Jesus would pray, Father, thy kingdom come, in his mind, he's going through me. I am the vessel. Everywhere I go, I am the vessel through whom you can work. Now Jesus says about us, when he's praying in John 17, Father, thou in me, Die in them. We've got to switch our mindset now for the revival from being always on the receiving side of the kingdom of God to being on the delivering side of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is within us, because Christ is in us. And it's still the Father flowing through that Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the hand of the Father outstretched. So when they prayed, Father, Lord, stretch forth thy hand, that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus, that hand is the Holy Spirit. So say it with me. The kingdom of God is within me. Christ is in me. And the Holy Spirit is is in Christ. Christ in me is the Holy of Holies. Pure and holy. And it, Christ in me is the, is the Christ in me is the vine. My body is the branch. And the, the Father's life flows through Christ in me through my body, to the world. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask Him? And that was an answer to teach us to pray. Now the purge, why all the purging? Why the fire? Presenting our bodies. A living sacrifice. 
holy and acceptable unto God. Now, he was reminding me today of all things of the first day I ever smoked. I, now, I'm going to date myself, Fred. I stole two L&M cigarettes. <laughs> How old are you? Who can remember L&M? Come on now. Okay, I got a few. I stole two L&M cigarettes out of my mother's purse. Yes, my, my saintly mother at one time smoked. I'll tell you a quick story. My mom smoked for about 15 years. Dad smoked forever in three days like his son. My mom just decided she's going to quit one day, and she just quit. My dad kept trying to do that and couldn't do it. <laughs> the symptoms, I mean, the, what do you call them? The withdrawals would always get him. He, he didn't quit until he was uh, almost 60, about 60. And a, a doctor scared him. I think the doctor just lied flat out, I'll be honest with you. Because I never saw my dad have one symptom of emphysema, never once. But that doctor scared him and said, I, Carp, I think I'm starting to see the beginning of emphysema. My dad never smoked again. <laughs> scared it out of him, you know. Well, I take that back. No, he did, too, because he tapered off. He did. Now, he tapered off. It was still hard for him. It always, it, but my mother could just, she just quit. Now, the reason I'm telling you that. Let's get back to the L&M, because this has everything to do with Christ in you. See, when it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and I was meditating all of the things that we've been talking about this morning. And of all things, he brought me back to that first day when I, when I stole two L&M cigarettes out of my mother's purse. We did really have a red barn. I went up behind the barn. Bless God, I'm going to smoke these things. Now, the reason he's focusing here on this is... Here's the reason why. See, my body was not craving nicotine. It had never had nicotine. In fact, when I started that, it did, my body, bless its darling heart, did everything it could trying to keep me from smoking. I thought I was going to throw up. I hacked. I wheezed. I, it tasted awful. My body, it wasn't my body at that point. It wasn't my body craving nicotine. It's that unrenewed part of the mind. See, and that's why Romans 12, 2 comes after Romans 12, 1. Because you're never going to present your body a living sacrifice unless you let your mind be renewed to think like Christ. Oh, well, why, why was I going up there to smoke? Why did I think that was a good thing? Well, I'm in high school, right at, you know, it's 14 years old. All of, and where I went to school, everybody smoked. Now, young people today, they don't understand. In my day, you smoked everywhere. We smoked at the grocery store. We smoked in the post office. We smoked on airplanes. There was no place you went where you didn't smoke. And the, uh, the school where I went, you either smoked or you better learn to fight because you were a goody two-shoes. Hope that makes sense, goody two-shoes. So it wasn't my body. It wasn't my flesh at that point. It was my soul. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be accepted at my school. I wanted to be f like everybody else. So, what, in fact, my body, bless its darling heart, it fought that. It fought it. It fought it. I thought I was going to throw up. You are going to. I, I made up my mind. <laughs> now that's where the stronghold is. But let's fast forward. Because my body did become dependent on nicotine. Because I did it. See, this is where all addiction comes from. And it doesn't matter whether it's... I've been, I have been delivered from alcoholism. I have been delivered from nicotine. I have been delivered from pornography. I have been delivered from the love of money, which is just as much an addiction. And I've been delivered to some degree from food. I used to be way bigger than I am now. I'm, I could lose some more. I know. Don't write my letters. I know. But I'm compared to how it used to be. And I'm telling you, it's all the same. 
It all comes from the same root. And it's really, it is the flesh, but it's not what we normally think of as our five physical senses. Now, it can become that. My body, the same way it tried to stop me from smoking. Boy, once I had it hooked now, it fought me trying to quit. I will kill you. <laughs> you're give me a cigarette or you're going to die. You will never see another day. I mean, it was just horrible. It lasted a long time. But see, now I've been free so long now. My body doesn't crave nicotine anymore. See, now even my natural mind thinks it's so stupid that I ever did it. It just thinks, well, how could you be that stupid? Well, I don't know. It just was. <laughs> but you could say the same thing about pornography. You could say the same thing about food back when I was, you know. Remember my old, my old thing, Krispy Kreme donuts? The first dozen are always good. You think I'm lying? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that was then. <laughs> Just so you'll know, I, uh, anyway, I drive by the Krispy Kreme all the time. If I have one a year now, it's unusual, one or two a year. Yes, sir. He's bringing it back around to the Lord's Prayer. So the mindset of Jesus, which he is developing in us, now we're at a, not only is he purging us from things of the natural, see if you're still addicted to pornography, food, drugs, alcohol, there is freedom for you. There is freedom for you. Now I have been delivered both ways. In the same way that, God, that the Lord did not send the madman of Gadara to a 12-step program. Because he was beyond that. He, the, he, there was no, he, he, had to, he had to have supernatural help. Okay? Well, God did that for me when it came to alcohol. For me personally. I had been an alcoholic for 10 years. I went to bed in that condition. I woke up sober. Never, I never had another drink from that day forward till now. And that's been over 40 years ago. And I never had a withdrawal symptom once, not even a headache. So I know what it is. He can supernaturally deliver you. Ask him to. Okay? But he most certainly did not do it that way when it came to nicotine. And I asked him about that. And he said, well, I can, obviously. He says, I can deliver anyone from any substance abuse of any kind. And I can do it without withdrawals. But by that process, you're free. But you have not matured. You have not learned how to take dominion over the flesh and conquer it. So that's why he let me go through the war with my flesh when it came to cigarettes. He was building maturity in me. That I, my flesh, bless God, has got to learn who's boss. And I've got more than that. I've got to learn who's boss. So... So the two have to go together. Romans 12, 1 and 12, 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be any longer conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, demonstrate what is the perfect, the accept, good and perfect and accept, good, acceptable and perfect will of God. I got it fine. Good, acceptable and perfect. They go together. It's got to be a renewing of the mind. I've got a friend offered me, a, a, we had a pizza in the car the other day. And, uh, off, man, what is it about pizza in a car? <sighs> the smell, that aroma, that fresh, hot pizza. <sighs> Everything in me wanted that slice of pizza. And it would not have been sin for me to have a slice of pizza. But on that particular day, it's a day of dictating to the flesh. And he says, I'll go ahead and take a slice. He's just being friendly and nice, you know. And boy, I wanted a slice too. <laughs> yeah, and I, these words came out of my mouth before I could even think about it. I said, I, I said, thank you, but no, because my flesh wants it so bad. I'm just going to tell it no. 
Now that is the, that's what Jesus has empowered us to do. Just know. See? Now this has all got to do with the kingdom of God because unless... Yes, sir. Just read 2 Corinthians 11 and you'll see that Paul presented his body a living sacrifice. See, most of us, if we ever... Okay, I don't want to prophesy that. Lord, I don't want to say that. Cut down those study. <clears throat> most of us would endure the whippings. <laughs> Let's say that. I don't know, really. Americans are so soft. We are. We're, we're pampered and spoiled and most of the world still lives on a cup of rice a day yeah. you know I think about I try and meditate the word I really do I try and think about Paul the first time the first time that he was beaten by the Jews now not the Romans first time he said five times by the Jews he received 40 stripes save one well that's 39 and the Jews' whip didn't have the bone and the stones and all into it. It was just leather straps. But still, they left scars. It brought blood. 39 of them. Can you imagine an, an American? 39 times. I think after lash number two. <laughs> 39 times. He hadn't done anything wrong. Paul, he didn't steal. He didn't. Rob, he didn't do anything wrong. He's just preaching the gospel. Five different times. You talk about presenting your body a living sacrifice. He says, I, I'm trying to picture what Paul's back must have looked like. 39 times five. Just a mass of scars. Stoned once and left for dead. Stoned. Can you? I've tried to meditate. I, I've never been brave enough to have someone yet throw a rock at my head. See, I want to see what this feels like. Would you throw this rock at my head? I haven't gone there yet. I may, hope I don't. But I've tried to meditate. You know, good-sized rock. Because you're planning on killing somebody. This is not gravel. <laughs> Something you can hold in your hand, but a good-sized rock. Maybe jagged, not round, you know. First time one of those hits your head. And they're standing there and they got a bunch of rocks. And they're not planning on stopping until you're dead. God, you talk about faith. And Stephen still believed. Believe. Stephen still believed to his dying breath. God is a rewarder. And he saw Jesus stand up. You know, normally it says Jesus is seated. You talk about it getting the Lord's attention. I said, I see the Lord standing. Now, you say, well, Stephen's reward is in heaven. Well, yeah, pretty much, I guess. But everything Paul did is also on Stephen's account. Because Stephen said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He forgave. And Saul of Tarsus was standing there holding the coats of those that did the stoning. He's the one that had the authority for it to be done. He wouldn't dirty his hands to throw the rocks, but he's the authority. And when Stephen prayed, lay not this sin to the church. That loosed heaven to go after Saul of Tarsus. And everything Saul accomplished, of course he gets a reward, Saul. Everything Paul accomplished, which was, he said, I've labored more abundantly than the all, but really not I, it was the grace of God in me. All that he accomplished, sure, Paul gets a reward. So does Stephen. So does Stephen, because it was Stephen's prayer of forgiveness. No wonder it's in the Lord's prayer. See, we're not even, I don't know if we'll get to that. I want to focus today mainly on thy kingdom come, because he's got to get us in the mindset, it's going to come through you or it's not coming. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Meditate it from the Lord's perspective. When he prays that, Father, do your work through me. 
I am the vessel through whom you can work. Right now, I'm the only vessel. Now, based on his mantle, he sent out the 12 and he sent out the 70, but they were all operating under his mantle. He is the authority. But in John 15, he says, now, you can't do anything without me. I am the vine. You are the branches. See, at that moment, he was the branch because he had a physical body. And if you'll allow me, the Holy Spirit was the vine at that moment, coming through his life, but being manifested on the branch, which was Jesus' body. In other words, everywhere he would go, fruit would appear. The lame walked, the blind saw, the deaf heard, devils cast out, mad men set in their right mind. But then in John 15, he's commissioning us. From this point on, once I go to be with the Father, he says, now without me, you can do nothing. He says, plainly, I am the vine. But now you are the branches. He says, and even when you're bearing fruit, my Father will come and prune you. That you bear more fruit. Well, that's exactly what's been happening through the blueprint. Going through the fire. He's been purging at deeper and deeper levels. God only knows. I, I know I've seen the, we're coming to the end of it. I also know what he said through prophecy, that there's some dark times coming. But are we to be afraid? Fear not. Let not your heart be troubled. See, I think about Stephen. I believe he, I don't think his heart was troubled. Was it pleasant? Good Lord, no. But his heart wasn't troubled. It's difficult for somebody to threaten you with heaven. Really. If you really have that alive in you, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Yes, sir. See, I'm hearing Galatians 2.20 now. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Now if your Bible says faith in the Son of God. That's okay. But it's just not real. It's just not right. That's not what he's talking about. A lot of people have faith in the Son of God. That God's not able to work through. Did you hear me say that? Faith in the Son of God. Is one thing. But when the very faith of Christ. When, you're, when your faith has been conformed to his faith. It's a whole new world. I did bring that verse, the only one that I already had pulled up, and I don't recommend any, I'm not, I, you'll never, I don't think you'll ever hear me endorse any Bible except the King James, and the Amplified, and I have reservations somewhat about the Amplified, <laughs> and I'm talking about the classic, that's the only one I know, they've got a new version now that I've never read, so when I say Amplified, I'm talking the classic Amplified, but it doesn't mean I don't read other translations, I do. And this one, how many have you heard of the Passion Translation? It's fairly recent. Of all the different translations, the Passion one, I think, got Galatians 2.20. They did it the best. Now listen to this. <clears throat> My old, this, this is Galatians 2.20 from the Passion Translation. My old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah. And no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. That's pretty good, isn't it? I'm crucified with Christ. Now, the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. 
We live in union as one. Isn't that John 17? Father, that they may be one, even as we are one. And I've taught for years, he's not talking there about a horizontal unity where we all dumb down our gospel to the lowest common denominator. No, he's talking about a vertical union, God the Father, God the Son, and you, and the Holy Ghost. So he says, we live in union as one. Now, this, listen to this. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God. Now, that's really good right there. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. Now, that's the best I've ever read. That is the best. I'm going to read it one more time without comment. My old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God. Who loves me so much that he gave himself for me. And dispenses his life into mine. Well, if that's not I am the vine and you are the branches, what is? His life commingles with us. We are one. We are one. Now, we're still separate, and we taught on that a week or so ago, where Jesus appeared to Ananias, and he had instruction, not Ananias that died for the money lie, <laughs> the other Ananias that was called to go pray for the Apostle Paul. And it's obviously two Entities. You got Jesus talking to Ananias, Ananias talking to Jesus. See? But Ananias, once he understood it, he went and the power of God flowed through him. See, the power of God flowed through that life of Christ on the inside of him. And when he prayed for Paul's sight, guess what? He saw. So, getting back to the Lord's Prayer, which is really the focus for today, I, we, we could go to the other parts of it. Uh, you know, Forgiveness and lead, leadership and all of that. But today let's focus on thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Because he expounds on that part of it. Where he says, give us this day our daily bread. In Luke 11, this one where he's talking about the bread. He's talking about our revival, really, the way I see it. Because he says, I've got a friend. He gives the example of the guy. I've got a friend who's come to me. He has needs. And I don't have any bread for him. So I'm coming to you, God, for bread. And the devil wants you to think God doesn't care. He says, go away and leave me alone. But Jesus said, no. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock, the door will be opened. See, and why do you, why do you knock on the door to be open so you can go in? And they just got through asking him, teach us to pray. Well, where had Jesus been? He'd been in prayer. He'd been in prayer with the Father. So I'm understanding. We, it, it, you, to, you can only give from God what you get from God. You want the bread? Come on in. Bread is received in my presence. Then you carry the bread out and deliver it to the world. That's the image, isn't it? Luke 11. Ask, seek, knock. He says if you do those things, he won't, de he won't deny you. And he won't give you something different. But you've got to go into God to bring the bread out that is God. Because the bread, he tells you what it is at the end. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give thee Holy Spirit to those that ask him. I thought we was asking for bread. We were. Just like in the life of Jesus, he never delivered any bread till he himself was filled with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is the bread manifester. So when we spend time with the Father, we ask, we seek, we knock, very much what we've been doing during this 
blueprint time for the last couple of years. Come away with me, spend time with me, spend more time in prayer. I was rereading it again yesterday during our prayer time, and it's just amazing how many times he specifically spoke about speaking in other tongues. Now, he talks about worship. He talks about other things, but it is amazing how much of the time. You know why I think that is? Because we don't know how to get there. But he didn't leave us as an orphan to find our own way. We have to let the Holy Spirit pray. He's the only one that knows how to get there. To bring these kind of understandings to our mind. So I'm almost out of time for today. So let me say it again. He is changing our mindset from always being on the receiving side. Always being on the receiving side to use our faith to receive for ourselves. And even using it really for our children and that type of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. That we should do that. But that's not where revival is. Revival is where we become the branch. Father, your kingdom come. Let's say it a different way. Let's say it this way. Father, see, now, I, we could pray maybe where, where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We could say it this way. Father, by your Holy Spirit. Father, by your Holy Spirit. No, no, I'm, I'm, thank you, Billy. <laughs> I'm just trying to compose this myself. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but, thank you. I love Billy. If you can't love Billy, you need to get saved. I'm telling you right now. But it's more like this. Say, Father, by your spirit, stretch forth your hand. I am a vessel through whom you can work. Christ in me is my life. He is commingled with me. There is no separation anymore. Father, thy kingdom come. I'm a vessel through whom you can work. By the hand of your Holy Spirit, reach through this vessel, reach through this life, reach through me so you can deliver the bread to the world. The first bread is Christ, that they be saved. That's just the starting point. They can be healed. They can be delivered. They can be set free. Father, I'm a vessel. We got to... When we say, thy kingdom come, now we will say this part. Father, thy kingdom come. Come through me. Come through Christ in me. I am a vessel through whom you can work. By the hand of your Holy Spirit, do signs and wonders. By the name of your holy child, Jesus, I am a vessel through whom you can work. We'll see you in 30 minutes.